Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Man, this is quite a deal. <laughs> My name's Camille, and I'm an alcoholic. And through the grace of God and Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, I've been sober since May the 2nd of 1972. And for that, I'm truly amazed. You know, this thing is a, a real spiritual deal um, because I'm not supposed to be here. There's many reasons I'm not supposed to be here, but but I, I know that if I wouldn't have been fooling around like I normally am doing at home, I run late a little bit, you know. I would have missed Al's phone call a couple weeks ago. And uh, I don't know if he's real persistent. He looks like he's a persistent guy. He probably would have tracked me down sooner or later. But anyway, because I was running late, that's why I'm here. Because he called me in. He said, um, we're having this little deal in Virginia Beach. Would you like to come out? And I said, well, tell me more. You know, and he said, well, pockets of enthusiasm. And, and we really believe in the big book and a program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, well, that sounds good. And... uh he said, one of your buddies is going to be there. And I said, who's that? And he said, Bob. And I said, I'll come. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because uh, Bob is part of the family. Now we have family and we have immediate family. Now, you are extended family, you know, and, and so we're all in this deal together. But, but Bob is really immediate family because we grew up in the kindergarten of Alcoholics Anonymous in Denver and uh, have shared many, many adventures I want to thank Al and Allison and, and uh, Valerie um, for all the graciousness and hospitality. We got a fruit plate last night that was just uh, wonderful. Bob and I were starving to death, and we kept saying, well, should we go eat or should we wait or should we go eat? You know, those decisions about eating is just tough on us. <laughs> we never had to worry about decisions about drinking. It was, yes, let's go do it right now. But uh, eating, we sort of have to think about it. So anyway, we, we're... Really appreciated that. And, and uh, the whole surroundings, I love the ocean. A couple weekends ago, we were in the mountains, you know, and I love the mountains, but I also love the ocean. It's, it's a spiritual. You know, you look out here and you look at all the, the waves, and like Peggy Martin was talking last weekend about the seagulls and how they were in the light, you know, and that's what we come to is the light. Well, I was looking out there last night, and they had all the lights on the ocean, and there were all those seagulls. You know, they're not dumb. They know that they need to be in the light, too. And, and see, I was in the darkness before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was listening to Johnny last night, and he was um, talking about when he came here, and, and I could really identify with a lot of that. But before we get going this morning, I would like to take a minute just to sort of get centered and help you maybe get centered. A friend of mine in Nashville, Tennessee, did this, um, oh, about a month ago, and I thought, well, that's a pretty neat idea. And, you know, everything we find here in Alcoholics Anonymous, we get from somebody else, and we steal it from somebody else, and if you use it ten times, it's yours. <laughs> so anyway, this is only my second time to try this deal, and, and so we'll go with this. And, and what uh, Scott was telling us is that he had heard where somebody had asked Lois Wilson, you know, that's Bill's wife, uh, what she did during the moment of silence after the serenity prayer. And Lois said, I invite God to the meeting. And I thought, well, that's a neat idea. After I spoke at the International in uh, Seattle a number of years ago, Don P. came up to me and he said, now next time you speak anywhere, he said, please invite God to the meeting. And I said, I will, and I've done that ever since. But, but the deal is, is that for all of us to invite God to the meeting. And when I invite God to the meeting, I ask him to uh, open my heart and let me speak with language of the heart and put down the language of the gutter. I believe that that has no place in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know there was one time that four-letter word was not love with me. So that's what I'm going to do. And I would like you to invite God into your heart so you can hear what you're supposed to hear. And if you don't have a God or don't believe in a God, I, I'm going to um, lend you mine. You know, and, and for this hour, you can use uh, the God of Camille's limited understanding and, and see where that goes. So if we could all take a moment of silence and, and open our hearts and minds and ask God to participate in this meeting. 
Thank you. Wow. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. Now, Louisville, Kentucky is famous for a lot of things. It's famous for fast horses and good bourbon and beautiful women. But sometimes it's famous for fast women and good horses, you know, and beautiful bourbon. I don't know. <laughs> they got some beautiful bourbon bottles. that I just sent one to a friend that doesn't have a problem. But um, how I got to Louisville is, is just really a miracle in itself. And even how I got to Alcoholics Anonymous is a miracle because, see, when I came here, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I came here as a result of uh, a little deal with the courts. And uh, I was 23 years old, and, you know, I really didn't have a problem. I didn't, I didn't even know that I had a problem. Uh, I thought I had problems with uh, driving somebody else's car, uh, the cops, you know, um, different things like that. But I didn't think that I had a drinking problem. So when they sentenced me to go to Alcoholics Anonymous in 1972, I thought, you know, this is tough breaks. I don't deserve this. I don't belong here. And, and God truly had been taking care of me in this deal because he put me right into the middle of a bunch of big book people. I was living in Vail, Colorado, and uh, I was so defended about anything because uh, living the life as a woman alcoholic out there by yourself, it, it's a rough life. And so I was pretty well defended, and, and, you know, I had my circle around me that was about, oh, 10 feet deep, and you couldn't have got in there with, a uh, you know, one of those uh, hammers. And so when they sentenced me there, I went, and it was a guy that, uh, he was an old cowboy, and he uh, told me his story. And I listened to it, and I thought, man, if I was that sick, I would have gone to Alcoholics Anonymous, too. I thought, you were a sick puppy. You know, I also thought you're a horny puppy, too, you know? <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I still went because I had to, you know? And, and so I went in, and it was five men and me. And it's real hard to hide, you know, when you're new. Now, in a meeting like this, all the people sitting on the back row, you can all hide. But, but when you're just within those few people, you can't hide. And when you're new, then they were... See, these people read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. That was their meeting. They would sit there and read it. Well, I was new, so that they attend, every sentence, for some reason, was directed to me in the big book. Every one. Well, I wasn't ready to be here, and so uh, because I wasn't, I, I started doing other things. Well, they had put me on antabuse. And if, for people who don't know what antabuse is, it's, it's something that is a little pill that you take, and when you drink, you get a little sicky-poo. And... Um, I had to go out and try that to make sure that it really did work. <laughs> I, I really have a, a tough, you know, tough way to go because I'm so stubborn. So anyway, so I uh, found out that, you know, you can smoke a little uh, of that non-habit forming stuff the president just puffs, you know. And so I found out you could do that, so I did a little of that, and I went to the meeting. And they didn't kick me out. They just told me, sit down. Well, I got real spiritual, and I grabbed the book, you know. And um, but they, they still didn't kick me out. So then I went, and I got a screaming kid, and this kid named Brandy, and I brought her into the meeting, and she screamed and wiggled all the way through. They didn't kick me out. See, I really wanted you guys to kick me out. I wanted, I don't know what I wanted, but I, I just didn't want any part of this deal. But you know what these guys did is that they loved me, and they really cared about me, and, you know, they never did anything that, that hurt me. And I was all, I was in a society that had become a bunch of users and abusers. I was a user and abuser of people, and that's what the people I was running with. And see, I couldn't look at the fact that I was drinking a fifth of whiskey every day, and that I could drink and I didn't get hangovers and I didn't get sick. See, I got my alcoholism, uh, through genetics. My mother was a running alcoholic, and I was taken away from her as a direct result of her drinking when I was six months old and put into the Montana State Orphanage for the uh, next six months. And, you know, I understand uh, I was very fortunate that I was taken away as a result of neglect and abuse at that time. But uh, so I got that natural, and so that's why I never got hangovers. I thought it was wonderful. You know, living in Vail, Colorado, um, it was a life that if I wouldn't have got there, I never would have got here as soon as I did. Because I was allowed to go out and drink and drink and drink until I just, I couldn't do it anymore. 
But when I came here, I was real well defended. And, and I just couldn't see that I had done all these things. And so when um, we started going through the book, and that's what really saved me, is that we started going through Bill's story. And uh, there's a sort of a movement on here to rewrite the book and change it. And then I've also heard that women can't identify with the book. And see, I really don't understand that because I've never had a problem identifying with the big book. And I'm going to share with you sort of the process that I went through. Um, and since I, I, my memory is getting shorter, the older you get, the, the worse your memory gets. I'm going to have to read some of this stuff. But uh, w we went through this process where we looked at Bill's story, and we looked at three things, how Br Bill drank, how he thought, and how he felt. And I found out that, you know what? I not only drank like Bill, I felt like Bill, and I thought just like Bill. I think that's pretty amazing because, you know, I'm a woman, Bill's a man. At least the uh, last story I've heard. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but anyway, you know, you go on and you look at, like, the first page of Bill's story. It, it says, here was love and applause, you know, war momentos, sublime. You know, I was part of life at last. I remember when I started drinking, I would go into the bars and I would feel part of life at last. I would give anything just to be part of life because... See, with myself, I didn't feel part of life. You know, I, I, I don't know what I felt like, but I, I surely didn't feel part of life. And so when I was in the midst of this, it, it was a wonderful feeling. Uh, going on down there, it said, um, you know, I was very lonely and turned to alcohol. You know, I, was, I drank when I was happy. I drank when I was sad. I drank when I was lonely. I drank when I was with people. So, you know, I drank all the time, but, but alcohol... Alcohol did for me everything that it promised. If you look in the uh, advertisements, it, it has always like the beautiful women or you're doing fun things or you're successful, all that stuff. When I drank, it was all there. It filled up my insides. See, alcohol was never my problem. It was my solution. You take away my solution, the thing that made me feel okay and not put something in its place, I was a miserable puppy. And And so then going on, I had this great imagination, too. And sitting in Vail, talking to a lot of those people that were really running the country, you know, I would sit there, and, and um, somebody said that uh, the other night, but I, you know, my talents for leadership, I imagined would place me at the head of a vast enterprise. You know, I believed that not only when I was sitting in Vail, I believed that after I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I figured that I should be running the show. They gave me a little job in the Young People's as a GSR. You remember what it was like when you first became a GSR? All of a sudden, you're running the group. Well, trying to run a group of alcoholics is like trying to run a bunch of, of bulls up in Wyoming. They're on this big 40, 50-foot field, and they're not going in any direction. You know? Can't even hurt them right. Not, there, there's not a good herd instinct in Alcoholics Anonymous. Everybody wants to do their own thing. I had another thought, too. It says the drive for success was on. I proved to the world I was important. And with everything in me for years and years and years, I, I tried to prove to the world that I was important. Because of myself, I did not feel important. And so I had to prove to you whatever I could do that I was important. And that was a strong drive in Bill. Going over on onto the next page, it says um, drinking was taking an an important and exhilarating part in my life. When I got to Vail, I went there originally to ski, okay? But I started drinking on a daily basis. And uh, be, I never had any money. You know, I, was, I, I went to Vail with $25 in my pocket and stayed there for two years. I have good survival skills. You know, and most alcoholics that I know of, we have good survival skills. And uh, so, and it was becoming just a, really a, a fun deal. It says, there was loud talk in the jazz places, and I love jazz today. You know, I used to go to Seattle and go to listen to good jazz. Um, it said, um, my drinking assumed more serious proportion, continuing all day and almost every night. And see, I thought that was normal. And, and I was allowed to do it. I, I'm just so grateful that I was allowed to do it. It says, the remnants of my friends terminated in a row, and I became a lone wolf. And I did. The only friend that I had when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous was a woman by the name of Kathy, and, and the reason she was a good buddy of mine because she played jazz piano. 
and I could go out and get Kathy jobs, and I was her agent, and I also could go along and drink. And see, I always wanted entertainment, you know, when I drank. You know, and Kathy, she didn't say anything. You know, she, she thought that she was a drunk. And she's not a drunk. She's just one of those heavy drinkers. And um, so I uh, looked at some of this stuff in, in Bill's story and, and, um, and went on and, and right through page 8. And it comes to the day, and I think it has to with any of us, it says, no one can tell the loneliness and despair I found in the bitter morass of self-pity. Quick sand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. And until I could fully concede to my innermost self that that was the real deal, I was living in self-delusion. And I uh, also went and looked at some of the things in the doctor's opinion. They used to read to me all the time when I first came here. For one thing, I couldn't read. And so that, you know, I, I didn't even finish high school. Uh, the reason I didn't finish high school is because I wanted to go off and, and take care of my first addiction. My first addiction is to a horse. And I could get on a horse and I could feel okay, and that took me into quitting high school, and I gave up everything in the world for a horse just so I could be with them. But it talks about, in the doctor's opinion, it says men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. And, it, and if... That didn't happen for me. I mean, I watched these other people that, um, like my husband, he shouldn't even drink. It's, a, it's the worst waste of whiskey and money I, I, for him to drink, you know? You know what happens to people like my husband? He would drink a couple drinks, and he would say, well, i got to stop. I'm feeling it. Well, honey, that is why I drank, you know? I love living on the edge. You know, this, this uh, antisocial personality disorder that I sort of have this living on the edge, I just love. You know, I remember when I was riding a motorcycle in Colorado, I got a real thrill coming out of the hills, and I was redlining. And for redlining on a bike, that means when it's going as fast as it can go and it can't really go any faster. And I was coming out of the hills, and if anything would have happened, I would have been dead. And that was a thrill. It was living on the edge. You know, I found that I have to do other things now, living on the edge, but I still have that in me. It says the sensation is so elusive... While they cannot admit it as injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the truth from the false. Now, what I find interesting in that statement is that I find not only did that happen when I was drinking, but it also happened after I was sober. Because if you don't get to the deal where you're honest, you don't start cleaning away some of the wreckage of the past. See, just like I said, if, if you tell something ten times, it's yours. Okay, if you go and you tell a lie ten times, it's yours. And you believe it. Well, what happens with me, and I don't know, you know, maybe you're like I am, but see, because I didn't know who I was and I didn't like who I was, I had to make up these things. So when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had absolutely no idea of who I was because I had told so many things. And, and so by the uncovering and, and doing the inventory, I started getting rid of some of this nonsense. You know, of who I wasn't. That's all inventory is about. It's who I'm not. You know? And if you do that enough time, who you are is going to show up. You know? And I think that's sort of neat. Who I am today is wonderful. You know, not in the ego sense, but because I am a child of God. And that's just amazing, you know, that I'm able to be here and share with you. And you're amazing. You know, the mere fact that everyone in this room is just sitting here. I mean, you're just sitting here peacefully and you're listening. I mean, if you were drunk, you wouldn't be sitting here. You would be arguing and fighting, and I don't know what you'd all be doing, but I think you would be a heck of a show. It would. It really would. I can, t I can just imagine what you all would get into. But anyway, it says to them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one, and it was, you know. I said, hey, I'm not different. Everybody that I'm around with drinks just like me. Well, I wouldn't associate with anybody that didn't drink just like me. I didn't trust them, for one thing, and I thought they were strange. So I drank with, with people that were either alcoholics or they were hard drinkers, and I understood them, and I trusted them. I wanted to, you know, put my life on them. And a little girl was drinking with me one time. I picked her up on a bus out of uh, Washington, D.C. See, sometimes I would sort of take these people captive because I got lonely every now and then. I said, she was riding on the bus from Denver, and I said, well, 
you know, I live in Bell, and I'll show you around. You want to have a good time? And she said, great. You know, and she was a secretary for some senator. And, and so she started going with me, and she, she run with me all week. And I put her back on the bus, and she said, God, I'm so glad to go home to Washington. She said, I couldn't stand another day of this happiness, you know? <laughs> and, and I did, because we, we started drinking in the morning. We drank all the way through. It was, it was just amazing. And the poor little girl, she couldn't take all that. But I just, you know, I just picked up and picked up other turkeys that came into town, tourists. Um, <laughs> okay. So then you go on and it says, they are restless, irritable, and discontent unless they can ex again experience the sense and ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Well, you know, if you take out the alcohol and you just leave us here and don't give us a new solution, I used to be restless, irritable, and discontent when I first came around until it just wouldn't quit. See, that's why I, I really had hoped that I was insane because I was under the belief system before I got into what I'm into now. But if you were insane, you could go to one of those hospitals or a doctor and you could get one of those little pills or you could get a little uh, ECT, which is electric shock. You know, they shock your brain. I thought that would be an easier, softer way to go. You could see how sick I was. And I had no idea because I thought, well, now if you're alcoholic, you know what happens to you if you're alcoholic? You have to come to these meetings and hang around with these people and work these steps for the rest of your life. And I thought, that's, that's just too much. And uh, I need a solution that's going to work, and it better be right now. So I, I started running with these people in Denver, Denver young people, and, and their deal was that they were big book people. And they believed in the book, and they believed in, you know, there's, there's three sides. There's three parts of this program. And, and maybe some people, they, they get into one or the other, but sometimes they miss the third. But there's a part, the unity. And the unity part is what we're doing here. It's the meetings, and it's the conventions, and it's the parties, and it's all the stuff. And young people, we were active. We used to go on picnics and motorcycle rides and conventions and, and sleep-ins and love-ins and all, all sorts of stuff. You know, we, we came out of the days of the hippies now, you know. And, and so we used to have a great time. And... uh so that was a big part. And, and you think about it, um, this is a hospital, and, and it's like an emergency room ward. Denver York Street Club, 1311 York Street, was like a big receiving hospital. And all these people would come into the emergency room ward. And, and Don P. talks about that, you know, we're, we're, we're not like new babies, and he, he mentioned about how his wife is working, taking care of children. And, and what she does with the new baby, she gets them and she pats them and she loves them and she takes care of them. Well, that's what we do. That's what I do when I, I'm dealing with a new woman in Alcoholics Anonymous because I don't believe in all this brutality stuff. I believe that at least for women, women, and I don't know about the guys, you, you know, I know you like to get love too, but I think for the women, you know, we need to be pampered or not so much pampered, but we need to be loved. Because we have been kicked, at least this woman alcoholic, I was kicked and used and abused. And I didn't need any more, so I didn't need another person to tell me, look it, you're worthless, you know, you're just not okay. I needed somebody to love me and tell me that it was going to be okay. And, um, and that's what they did in Denver Young People. And that's, you know, I, I feel so close to Bob because uh, being part of the family, I just know that when I... I mean, Bob's presence or Don's presence or Gary's presence or any of the other hundred people that we know out of that group, I know that I'm in part of a family and we're loved and we're taken care of. It's a very close relationship. I have a close relationship with my sponsor. I talked to her about a week ago and she said, please be honest when you go to the conventions and tell them the truth. And I said, yes, ma'am. And uh, I have a lot of respect for that lady. She's tough old rod. And, uh, but she has a lot of love. And, and there's a lot of difference between brutality and compassion. And so um, we started doing that deal, and, and uh, Bob was talking about different things he, he could just quote. And see, I wanted to be in. I had a, a new addiction that I got, and it was to approval. When I came here, I wanted your approval so bad that I had to learn the lingo. The lingo of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I learned it. I used to stay up at night and study this book so I could go to the meeting the next day and quote, you know, because I wanted you to like me, you know. 
You know why I worked the steps the first time? Not believing that I was an alcoholic because I wanted you to like me, and that was part of the deal. And you know what would have happened if I wouldn't have done that? I wouldn't have been around. Because I was so sick when I came here, and I was so well defended, I couldn't see. I couldn't see the whole deal. And you see that with people that come in here. And, and I really gravitate to the people that are angry and they're hostile, you know, and they want to sit there and argue with you. You know, I used to go up York Street and not argue with them. And, and so we, we, before I really got into it, they'd say, well, now you know there's some tests in the book, Camille. And uh, if you don't believe you're an alcoholic, why don't you go out and do controlled drinking? Well, years ago they had what was called the Marty Man test. And the Marty Man test was where you'd go out for 90 days or 60 days or however long you wanted to do this deal and, and drink controlled. Two drinks, no more, no less. And, and so Frank was talking to me, and he said, why don't you go do this? And Frank is about 6'6", six, six and a big hunk of a guy, you know, in a gruff voice, and, and it bleeds in the big book. And he said, if you don't want to do this, you'll go out and do it. I said, okay. So there's a bar just down the street, and I trotted right down there, and I sat up there, and I promptly ordered myself a drink, and I sat and I drank it. And then I had my second one, and I drank that one, and I thought, you know, two drinks have never done anything for me. Never in my life have two drinks done anything for me. I'm going to change the test. I'm going to make it three drinks. <laughs> so I had three drinks, and I stopped, and I trotted right back up to York Street, and I told them. I said, well, I'm going to do this deal, but it's going to be a three-drink deal. Frank looked at me, and he said, kid, you've just flunked. <laughs> you know, he said, why don't you try this program of Alcoholics Anonymous? I had a guy that, uh, you know, we get in here for different reasons, and this guy called my white knight. And his name was Whitey, or his name is Whitey, he's not dead. But anyway, we, we, we get in here for different reasons. And, and uh, so God knew what would get me in here. And uh, this guy had blonde hair, blue eyes, he looked good, he smelled good, he had a big diamond ring, he, he drove a Cadillac and was a veterinarian. And he came up to me after this young people's meeting that I went in there and said, I don't know whether I'm an alcoholic, but I'm here. You know, and he said, would you like to go to coffee? And I, God, I would have went anywhere with that man, you know. <laughs> You have what I want, honey. And I, he had, I, did, I, did, I didn't know what the man had, you know. But anyway, he was nice to me. And so I went, and he, you know, we, we sat there and drank coffee. And I told his wife years later, I said, Eleanor, I sure am glad that, that you allowed me to share your husband for evenings on end. And I don't know, when you're new, you just are sick. And you, I just talked and talked and talked, and he just listened. He just listened. And he never did anything, you know. Uh, he was just the most gracious man. God sends me good people. And um, so anyway, we, we uh, were going every night to a different meeting, and he introduced me to all these people, and they were all so warm and loving and everything. And I thought, well, this is a pretty good deal. So I thought, well, I'll go, and, and I'll go to the meeting. We're go going another night, Denver Young People's. And so I went and I waited. And, and now I don't know what happened that night, but anyway, he didn't show up, and it was something about an emergency hysterectomy on a cat. Now, I've never heard of an emergency hysterectomy on a cat. C-section, maybe, but not a hysterectomy. But anyway, he didn't show up, and I got very unhappy. Because, see, I was coming to Alcoholics Anonymous for all the wrong reasons yet. And uh, that's what happens when people that come through the courts, you know, and are forced in here. But anyway, um, so I went out, and I did what I knew how to do. And I went, and I scanned the bar, and I found this old boy from Laguna Beach, California, and he was a dentist, and I went up to him, and I said, Honey, would you like to go drinking? And he said, well, you'd love to go drinking. He had absolutely no idea what was on my agenda. <laughs> but what was on my agenda and what was on his was two different things. Because by this time, I was not interested in anything but drinking. All the other nonsense that you do when you're drinking, I was not interested in. And, and so, um, and I'll let you figure out what that other stuff is. But anyway, so we went out, and we drank, and, and that was an evening, if you're going to slip, in Alcoholics Anonymous, I wanted to get drunk. I wanted to have a big wing dig, you know, really to do some kind of a deal. And I drank and I drank, and you know what? I didn't get drunk. And that bothered me because that was when I really wanted to get drunk. And I couldn't get drunk. No matter how much I drank that night, I couldn't get drunk. So anyway, um, he walked me home, and I said, I'm sorry, but men can't come in here. And, and uh, he said, oh, okay. And so he wandered off. But I was fortunate that evening. So I called Whitey up, and he came down the next day, and he said, you know what? He said, uh, I don't think you're ready for this thing. 
And I said, really? And he said, yeah, I'm going to go out and buy you a case of whiskey. And I thought, my God, you know, what would GSO at the home office in New York say about a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous saying they're going to buy me a case of whiskey? Now, you know I didn't think of that, but I thought about it years later. And uh, anyway, it was the best thing that he could have said. Because when people come in here under duress, I felt that you guys were all my probation officers. You know, I felt that if I didn't do the deal, you were going to report me and I was going to have to go sit in jail. Now, the first time you go to jail, I thought that was an interesting thing, and I was there as a, a reporter. I was, you know, writing a story about their lives, and I just happened to be in there, too. You know, I wanted to experience it, but after you've done it about three times, it loses its, its fun and flair. And I didn't want to go there for too long, so anyway, um, but uh, so that took away that, that one excuse. And uh, I um, looked at him, and he said, but you know, I know that you're hurting. And he said, you don't have to hurt the way that you are. Well, I started to cry and say, oh, yeah, you know, and, and, and I could just feel the pain. And for any woman and probably any man in here, that I mean that feeling, that just gut, gut-wrenching feeling that comes up within you that you just can't do it anymore. And at that moment, that was a surrender because I can't, became willing to do anything at that moment that he wanted. And he said, now, I want you to make a commitment for one year. And he said... Whatever happens in that year, do give it your best shot. You know, get a sponsor, get a home group, read the book. Whatever they ask you to do, the only thing I want you to do is say yes and win. He said, because it may be your only chance. And I believe that is true for me. Because you don't know when you leave here. See, I always held it in my, my belief system that if this deal doesn't work, I can go out and drink. Because I always believed I could go out and drink and come back. Well, I've seen too many people over the last 23 years that went out and drank and they never came back. You know, they either ended up in the penitentiary or they ended up having a terrible car accident or they got shot or something, you know. And so that that idea had to be smashed, but that was the idea that I had. And so he said, just give it your best shot and and start doing this deal. And then he said the next word, and I I probably could have just died because I felt that he had taken the knife and just put it in my gut and just sort of wrenched it around. He said, I want you to get a woman sponsor. And I said, now, why would I want to get a woman as a sponsor? I said, I want you as my sponsor. And he said, no. He said, men sponsor men and women sponsor women. Because he knew that we were going to be in a very vulnerable situation. And that's why women sponsor women and men sponsor men. Because I know I would have done anything to make it okay. And, you know, that's why I needed a woman. And he was smart enough to know that I needed a woman. So anyway, we drug back up to York Street, and they they kept getting on me about this sponsor business. And so there was a lady at the desk sitting there, and so I said, Lynn, will you be my sponsor? Well, see, you can get sponsors for all sorts of different reasons, and I just wanted one so they'd get off my back, you know? And Lynn was good for a ride. She was good. She was a mother image, and she was good for a home-cooked meal, and she was good for a lot of things, you know? But I didn't want to get too deeply into the book. And and so later on I did, and I had to get a sponsor by the name of Sharon. And, and then she took me through the work for the first time. I'm going to jump ahead because it, it's really important, because I want to get into where my life really started to change. And it changed. And, and you know, I'm not saying that it didn't. And, and I, I didn't take a drink, but there was a number of years that I was saying Alcoholics Anonymous because of my resistance that I didn't get the full benefit. Because I believe that you can hit your bottom, and you either drink your way into your bottom, or you stay in here and you stay sober, and you're either going to hit your bottom or you're going to go nuts. And, and so I had to go out. I'd work the steps, and I figured my illusion was is you can stay in 10, 11, and 12, and, and that's all you have to do. And, and so I did that for a number of years. I just sort of stayed in 10, 11, and 12, you know. Well, according to Ted, and I mean, Ted has all these things you got to do with 10, 11, and 12. You're, you're a busy person. Well, I wasn't doing Ted's 10, 11, and 12. I was sort of doing it my own deal, which was up in my head. I figured, well, I can figure it out in my head. I don't have to do all this writing. You know, you write on the fourth step. Why would you ever want to write on the 10th and 11th step, you know? Meditation, good morning, God, reporting for duty, and off I'd go. You know, <laughs> whatever direction we were going to go, and we would go. But I had to go out and, and, and live life and, and um, do some different 
things, and, and I may get back to that, and I may not. But um, anyway, when I was 12 years sober in 1984, and uh, I had uh, made some decisions along the way, and I think we all make decisions that uh, were probably not in the best interest of mine, but I needed those experiences, so I care with another woman that you can live like a damn fool in Alcoholics Anonymous and not drink, but you're going to hurt, and if you don't get back into the work, you're going to die. And uh, what happened to me is that my health started going downhill. And see, you don't get away scot-free. You may not drink, but my health just started deteriorating. And I'd been working for a company that I couldn't stand, and I don't know why they kept me working. Well, I do. I was in the union. Unions are almost detrimental to alcoholics because they, they let us get away with a lot of things. And so I uh, started having some ma major health problems. And I also had some major men problems, and I'm going to read you one part because this was my philosophy, and then we'll go on with it. But this was my philosophy in, in Alcoholics Anonymous with men. And um, I don't know whether anybody else has lived like this, but anyway, uh, this is the way I felt about men. It says, do not be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. <laughs> it says, search out another alcoholic and try again. It says, you are sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer. You know? It says, we find it a waste of time to keep chasing a man who cannot or will not work with you. If you leave such a person alone, he may soon become convinced that he cannot recover by himself. It says, to spend too much time on any one situation is to delay some other alcoholic an opportunity to live and be happy. You see, I wanted you to be happy, you know. It says, one of our fellowship failed entirely with his first half a dozen prospects. And I, I had more than half a dozen, but anyway. It says, he, he often says that if he had continued to work with them, he might have deprived many others who since have recovered of their chance. And that was my philosophy when I first came in here with the alcoholics, and then I switched. I got tired of the alcoholics, and I went out there to the normal world, and it wasn't any better. Uh, so, but I had made a decision that I was going to go with this old boy, and, and uh, my sponsor at the time told me, she said, if you stay with him, you're not going to stay sober. I never say that to anybody. I don't give them the challenge, you know, because I'm still alcoholic, and don't challenge me. I'll, I'll prove to you that you can stay with an absolute ding-dong and stay sober. That's putting it mildly. I told you, I don't use those four-letter words anymore. And, and so anyway, he was a gambler and alcoholic, and, and you, he loved to chase women and have all these affairs, and, and he was just a wild, wild man. And, and I, I probably should have gone down on But anyway, um, I tried to control him, and my sponsor at the time, I got another sponsor by the name of Wilma W., and she said, well, you're going to get tired of him someday. So she said, you must enjoy it, all that chaos. So if you do, I don't want to hear about it. Just have a good time, you know? And I thought, oh, gee, you can't even get any sympathy out of the sponsor business. But uh, anyway, finally, it reached the point, and you cannot live. See, I, I just kept thinking that you can live any way you want to. And I found out there's a price. I didn't drink. But not everybody has that luxury. But I slowly started going insane. I wasn't what you would call sober. I was what you'd call dry. And so at, at uh, 12 years sober, what happened with me is that he had, he had done the deal one more time of going out and spending all our money, and I made sure to finance, get our finances so tight. If you got a gambler and want to, you know, pin them in, make sure that all your credit cards are maxed out and you got all the charge or all the expenses so high that you need every nickel to live. Well, see, I figured that would control them. Well, it didn't. They went out and gambled about 10000 And I was just unhappy, to say the least. Well, he and I had a few words. And, you know, I, I'm not going to let any man hit me. I, I don't care how sweet he is, you know. And, and I got a little worried for my health. And so, uh, anyway, he left, and, and I uh, thought, my goodness, there, there's going to be a problem here. So I ran over to the Aurora Mall. That was when you could go in to any uh, sporting goods store, and I said, I, I would like to get a 38 a box of shells. And he said, lady, I'm not going to sell you that. He said, you're not going to do any good with this gun tonight. And I said, I didn't come here. I'm not in church. Don't you tell me. You know, I didn't come here to hear about your lecture or anything. I said, just sell me that. 
gun, and so he he did for about three hundred bucks. And and I went home and I loaded the gun and everything and and uh went to sleep. And I, but my hand was on on holding the gun with my finger in the in the trigger. And if anybody would have come through the door, I'm telling you, they would have been dead. Now that's just total insanity. Okay, and that's what happens. Not working the steps on a regular basis, doing your own life, you know. And I hadn't taken a drink and see what I was using. My excuse, well, I'm not drinking. Hey, I'm okay. If you, if I'm not drinking, I gotta be okay. Don't you understand? And so anyway, he didn't come home and when I, uh, woke up the next morning, I knew that I was nuts. And I got on my knees and I said, God, listen, if you want me to be a nun, for the rest of my life, no sex, no men, I'm willing. And see, that was another thing. Until that point, I hadn't been willing to do that. And, and so anyway, I went and I packed all his clothes and, and um, changed the locks and uh, put him in his car with a little note. And I said, it's been fun, but it's all over. And he, when he saw me, he said, what do you mean it's all over? I said, it's all over. I never told him that I had a gun. I never told him anything. I just walked away. And see, God just moved him right out of town, him and his little cocaine girlfriend. They just zipped. Uh, they were out of my life. Well, it was it was more fun and frolic in 1984 that I had planned. I uh, slipped on some oil. I was just walking down the street, and I slipped on some oil. And as a result, I, I ruptured the disc. Well, I figured I'd hurt my back, you know, for a long time, and I, I'd just keep going. Well, it got to the point I couldn't walk. And uh, that's the only reason I went to the hospital. When you can't walk, when your leg's totally numb, you got to do something. And uh, so I said, okay, well, the uh, doctor, he came in. And he said, you know, you've done so much damage to this leg, I don't know if you're going to be able to walk for the rest of your life. And he said, well, we'll try the deal and see if it works. So he uh, did surgery on my back. And, and um, I, you see, I'm walking today. But what happened is that the leg was still numb, and, and uh, I, six weeks after surgery, I went out, and I sl- stepped off a curb, and I fell, and my kneecap went one place, and I broke a foot. Well, you know, it was like it was surgeries, and it was surgeries, and it was like I couldn't get away from this, you know, and I kept breaking things. And see, God really has to hit me over the head because I'm so bullheaded. Well, I'd run into Don uh, P., and um, he said, what you doing? And I said, well, I'm having a lot of surgery right now. And, and uh, he said, well, why don't we, we, you know, he said, why don't we get into uh, this big book study? And, and so I said, okay. And Don and I started meeting every Wednesday for breakfast, and that was when he was a trustee. And it was, it was really interesting uh, to listen to all his stories about when he went to Russia. And so uh, we started going through the deal. And you know what? My life started changing. Because what I did is that I recommitted to Alcoholics Anonymous. I resurrendered to Alcoholics Anonymous. And as a result, I worked the first step totally. And I really surrendered. And my whole life changed. And I thought to myself, well, dummy, why didn't you do this? Why, why didn't you do this when you first walked in the door? And the only thing that I can say is that I was so terrified of everything that I couldn't allow myself to even be honest. And I was so lucky that I got to stick around because I might have missed it. So as a result of going through that and then looking at my belief system with my higher power, I I redid another inventory. And and what happens, now I think it's, it's great. If you do 10, 11, and 12 exactly like you're supposed to, you'll never have to do another big inventory. But if you do it like I did for eight years in your head, by George, you're going to have to write sometime. You know, and I had to do some real detailed writing. It wasn't the same old stuff that I did in my first inventory. You know, my first inventory, I got rid of all my secrets. You know, if I hadn't got rid of all my secrets, I never would have stuck around. But I had to look at some of my other character defects, some of the other stuff that was going around. I had to start making some amends, some real amends. Because I made amends before, and they were just some, sometimes if you make amends without talking to your sponsor, they're disastrous. Then you have to go back and make amends for the amends, you know? And uh, I got back in the service work, and I became a GSR. Uh, I I bought this suit when Don and I and a bunch of us were out in Los Angeles at the forum. And if you've never been to one of the forums, 
you know, on the GSO forums. They're wonderful because they tell you all about this deal and all about Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, so the uh, International came along, and, and I, I, I really made that commitment to God, and I not got involved in any with anybody. And I found out, you know, that Camille can live by herself. She can pay her own bills. She doesn't meet, need a man to make her okay. She can have a lot of women friends, and, and it's a lot of fun in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'd also gotten involved in the International Women's Conference, and I started doing that, which was amazing since I didn't like women when I came here. And I, thought, I found out they're not too bad. Um, but uh, so anyway, this lady said, well, we're going to the International Montreal, and do you want to go? And I said, oh, I don't know. I, you know, I, I was still in this, this job, and I said, I, I just want to stay. And she said, no, come on, come on, come on. And, and you don't know this lady. She's 42 years old, and she's just a hound. She hounds you to death. You know, those old timers do. When they get an idea in their head that you got to go do something, you might as well surrender and go. But, but anyway, so I, I uh, went ahead and I, I surrendered and, and I got on a plane that they all went through Atlanta and, and I got on another plane and I went through Boston. I don't know why, but anyway, I did. And we got on this other plane that wasn't, that airline just doesn't exist anymore. You know, God, uh, Bob calls it God's airline. So, I got on the plane, and there were four people in the back, and there were there was this guy sitting right next to me. I mean, in a big plane, you know, 40-passenger plane. He's sitting right, not two over, just right next to me. So since he was there, I said, hi, you know, where are you going, Montreal? Where are the planes going to Montreal? I said, well, what are you going to do up there? He said, well, I'm going to a convention. I said, well, that's nice. And, and I said, I am too. He said, I said, well, what kind of convention are you going to? He said, well, I'm going to the International Alanine Convention. And I said, well, that's great. I'm going to the other, the AA convention. And so we were conversing and everything. And, and uh, he said, well, what hotel are you going to? And I told him, I said, well, I'm going to the Holiday Inn. He said, well, that's interesting. So am I. And I thought, now, buddy, you're giving me a line, you know. <laughs> so I, I just wanted that, you know. So anyway, he said, well, would you like to share a cab? And I said, well, sure, you know, that's nice. And he said, I'll get you a wheelchair. Well, I'd gone up there, and I had a full-length cast on my leg. You know, well, I'd got, I had so many surgeries, I just went to AA no matter what. I was going to go, and so I figured just because you have a full-length cast on your leg, why should that stop you? And so uh, the only thing is that when I travel, I like to have choices. And uh, I had enough bags there. I could have gone to Europe for a month. And, and uh, so he looked at all that, and he said, where, where are you going with all that? And I said, honey, I like choices. And uh, he said to me, he said, well, you know, I'm not a weightlifter. I'm an attorney. And I said, it, I said, at this point, it doesn't really matter what you are. We still need to go through customs. And so there Bob is. He's pushing me in a wheelchair and pulling all this luggage. And he, and his, he had a little bag, too. So anyway, we get down there. And uh, we got up to the room, and there... Now, when you go to the International, okay, which is going to be up in Minnesota, make sure you know what kind of rooms you're getting because she thought she was getting three rooms. She got three beds. And she had begged everybody in Denver. She had 15 people, okay? So here you can imagine it was total chaos with these women. And women getting, you know, when women get excited, it's like, go it's like going into a chicken coop. I mean, the pitch just elevates way up there, and it was sky high, and they were all running around. I got to tell you, one little side note, when I was a kid, we had a, a ranch in Montana, and my favorite excitement was to go through the chicken house and scream and holler, and the dog would bark. <laughs> chaos. I love chaos. I'm a child of chaos. But anyway, so here all these women were, and they were just running all around. Well, finally, Bob, you know, he had thrown his bag. He was one room below us. He was throwing his bag, and he came up there, and he said, Well, ladies, what, what's the matter? I'm here to help. Like a good Al-Anon, you know? <laughs> God, I love him. So anyway, so he, he uh, said, Well, I have a bed, you know, and, and you know what, two of the older ladies, one runs a central office in Denver, and the other one was about 75 years old. I mean, they could have been with the Denver Broncos. They charged up and snatched <laughs> that, you know? And, and, and so they stayed, you know, down there. They would get on rest in our room and go stay with Bob. So anyway, so we adopted them, and I saw my sponsor, and, and she said, uh, what you doing? I said, well, I, I met this guy, and she said, hold it. She said, with your choice of men, she said, you know you picked every craphead that ever walked into 1311 York Street, and um, she said, you have no, no good uh, deal, so she said, we got to meet him. 
So anyway, they met him, and we had dinner, and she looked, and she said, well, you might have a winner. At least he can pay for your half of the bill. And I said, all righty. But um, we, uh, that was the time, and I was so grateful. I did go to one Al-Anon meeting, and I got to see Lois uh, W., and, and that was the last time she ever spoke. And she said, you know, they call this a spiritual meeting. And she said, isn't that what Alcoholics Anonymous is about? It's spirituality. It's a spiritual deal. And so uh, when Bob and I parted, I just gave him a little peck on the cheek, and I thought, well, it's been fun. I'll probably never see him again in life, you know. And because I wasn't really looking anymore, and, and um, anyway, he, uh, he started calling me. <laughs> he had a watch line. <laughs> He'd call me and wake me up every morning. It was 8 o'clock in Kentucky and 6, or 6 o'clock in Denver. And we, we started to visit. But see, Bob's a visitor. He loves to visit. He's at home anywhere. He'll go out and visit, you know. And um, so we started to visit. And see, that was the deal I had made with God, is that the next man I met, I wanted to have a friend first. You know, I come from the 60s generation, and the whole moral thing just got all screwed up with a whole bunch of us, you know, and it took us a number of years to come back to where it should be. AIDS has helped, you know, it really has, because it slowed down a whole bunch of people. And uh, so I'm glad I'm not still out there. It would be tough be tough. But anyway, so um, we started conversing, and he came out to Denver, and, and I was worried we would get in a compromising position. Well, ladies, if you're ever worried that you're going to get in a compromising position with a man, this is what you do if he's going to come and spend the weekend at your house. You go ahead and take him to an AA convention. Then you go take him to a couple football games. Then you go take him uh, the tour of the Rocky Mountain National Park. You take him up and take him for a boat ride up at Lake Dillon. You know, and then you take him around and show him all the sights down at the Air Force Academy. And I'll tell you, he was pooped. <laughs> but you know what? He kept coming back. <laughs> the next year, I was going down to Dallas, and, and uh, I was going down to a forum down there. And so I told him, I said, well, that's where I was going. Well, he said, I'll go down there, too. Well, I was worried that, you know, there again. So I brought a lady by the name of Jeannie. She was just coming. I said, Jeannie, do you want to go to the forum? Well, Jeannie was two days sober. She was, you know, and I took old Jeannie down there, and she was in the DTs half the time on the plane. And so, I mean, my mind was busy with Jeannie, you know, and so Bob would say, well, you want to come up to my room? I said, no, I really got to go check on Jeannie. So if you want a chaperone, bring a wet drunk with you, you know? I said, they're great. You know, because how is he going to argue with you? You know, your primary purpose, you've got to help the alcoholic. So anyway, he kept coming back. And uh, about a year and a half later, it was, it was how to see the USA, the Bob Frey way. It, it turned into one of the most romantic things that I'd ever experienced. Hmm. Really, truly amazing. And uh, I'd gotten involved in Alcoholics Anonymous again. I, I started the love affair. The Alcoholics Anonymous. I was sponsoring women, and we were going through the big book, and, and we were, I was involved in service. You know, I talked about the unity and the triangle and the circle. Well, you know, the unity, okay, the program is it 12 steps. You know, the service is the other part. And I figure if you're in the unity program and service, all of a sudden you become whole. And that's what I did. I became whole. And it wasn't any great miracle that I had done. I just got involved in all the stuff that we do. And see, I lost myself. See, I'm the problem, you know? And I need a solution that works in my life on a daily basis. And so if I do all three parts of the program, I get to live in a world that I don't understand. A lot of times you don't understand me, but, you know, I'm able to live here. And so uh, anyway, I, I got fired from this job. And that happens when you have a workman's comp thing against a company. So I thought, well, I'll go up. You know, if I hadn't been involved in Alcoholics Anonymous, I wouldn't have said I got fired from the job, and I think I'll go up to CSU and, and go to the true love of my life, which is with horses. I probably would have wanted to get an AK-47 and run down there and show them what I thought about them. But you know, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have time because I had to go to a meeting. Or I had to talk to somebody I sponsored. And so I went up to CSU and started in the veterinarian science deal, and, and, and I sort of forgot about that my back was deteriorating. And, uh, but I, it, it was just sort of a vehicle. 
for me to get from point A to point B. And so then when I went out and saw Bob, because Kentucky is horse country. You know, it's horse heaven. Virginia is, too. There's a lot of beautiful horse farms around here. And so I went out there, and, and uh, I just fell in love with the horses and everything, and I got offered a job. And uh, so I went back and told Bob, and he said, well, shoot, you can come and live with me. And I said, hold it, pal. I said, you know what? Uh, the next man that I live with, I'm going to marry. And he said, no. He said, I'm sorry. He said, I've been married twice, and I'm not getting married again. And I said, well, I don't know what we're going to do. So we compromised and got married. Uh, <laughs> And you know what? He's my best friend, my buddy. And my buddy found out I was coming to Virginia, and boy, he, he just, you know, um, when you're over 55, you get these reduced rates on the airlines. And he sure found himself a reduced rate on the airlines so he could come. And we had more fun just walking. You know, we are walking in the sand the other day and had our shoes off and, and just sharing the intimate parts, the parts that I never thought that were possible. And so I moved to Kentucky. Now, that's a culture shock. Now, I'm a woman, you know, I was born in Idaho, and I was raised in Montana, lived on a cattle ranch, and, and rode my horse to school when I was a kid, and uh, sort of a wild woman um, all my life, and, and then I went to Colorado and did all that deal, and so here I move into Kentucky, and those people, a lot of people in Kentucky, they have been born there, and they're raised there, and they stay there. It's a unique thing for me, and they're ladies. Now, Southern Bells. Southern bells are very interesting, you know. They're not weak. Don't you men ever think that a southern bell is weak, by George? She got you fooled, because she wears the pants, you know. And uh, but anyway, I learned about these southern bell ways, you know, and it is very interesting. And sort of, honey, can you help me? And they get a lot of help. They get more help than going in there and pushing and shoving. I'll tell you that. But uh, I went to Louisville, and, and I was involved also in the International Women's Conference. And um, got, did a, another woman's conference, and I started to fall in love with women and Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm so pleased today to see so many ladies here, and especially because the pockets of enthusiasm. You know, a, a woman has just as much right to be here as any man. You know, there there is no difference when it comes to alcohol. And I go to a lot of places, and, and uh, the women just aren't, aren't coming around, like, and it sort of bothers me. But anyway, I see you ladies are here, and you're accounted for. But uh, one of the gentlemen came up here, and he said, you know, uh, you were the first uh, chairman for the International AA Women's Convention. Now, I never thought about that, because that convention has been going on for 30-some years. But in Orlando, Florida, and he, he was the token man, you know. He was the only man that they allowed into the International down in Orlando, and I'll let him tell why he was there. But anyway... Uh, they made me uh, the chairman of and that was when it changed from being the National Women's Conference to the International. And so I became chairman of that. And I'll tell you, having a board that's made up of alcoholic women from all over the United States and Canada, you can't tell them what to do either, you know? <laughs> you are a trusted servant. You are not a trusted dictator. And if you want to grow, get in the service work. Because I'll tell you, it'll make you call your sponsor more. It'll make you write more inventory, you know? Uh, if you have real sensitive feelings, don't get in the service work. Because I don't care. What you do is never going to be enough. You know, just like Al, I know that this is a wonderful conference, you know, but it's never going to be perfect because there's always going to somebody coming along and saying, you know, I could have done that better, or you should have done it this way. And so when you get in the service work, you just know that you've got to have broad shoulders and you just go on about your business. But I did that for a few years, and, and um, there, uh, you know, stick around for this whole thing because there's there's more. It's more than just not taking a drink. And if there would have not been more than not taking a drink, I wouldn't have stuck around here. But I just stick around to see what's going to happen up next. So anyway, I after I was working in Kentucky for a while, my back still started deteriorating, and I couldn't figure out why. And, and see, normally people have degenerative disc disease, and I mean, when we all get old, we all have that problem. But mine was going at an accelerated rate. And I started getting into a chronic pain syndrome, and I couldn't get rid of the pain. And, and then I, I ruptured another disc, and they wanted to do major surgery. And I said, no, I, I, I'm just tired of surgery. I don't want any more surgery. And uh, it got to the point the doctor came to me, and he said, you know, 
you're going to have to live on narcotics for the rest of your life. I'm 20 years sober. And I said, you know what, I didn't sober up in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous to live on narcotics the rest of my life. And he said, well, you won't be able to stand the pain. And I said, buddy, just give me a year. It was the same old deal. Give me a year, and I'll do anything I have to do, physical therapy, you know, whatever it is. What I did is I went right back to the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I started working it again. And every place that it had alcohol, I put pain. And I went through it, and I wrote inventory, and, and uh, you know what? I don't have that kind of pain today. So it works, and it works for many, many things. And uh, so it's like, well, now what are we going to get into? Well, there's more of the story here, you know. It's like Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, the rest of the story is that my sponsor, when I graduated from college, which I didn't want to go to in the first place, um, she, I walked out. I got a degree in business from CU when I was in 1984, and she said, when are you going to graduate school? And I thought, well, you ought to pat me on the head or something and say, good job, you know. I said, I'm not a Rhodes Scholar. I mean, it takes everything. I didn't even read when I came in here. I hadn't finished high school. And here you want me to go on. And, and so um, I said, yes, ma'am. That's about all you can do with one of those Nazi sponsors. <laughs> she carried a 38. Uh, her, cl- her sponsor was Clancy. <laughs> so anyway, but uh, so... She said, well, you, you'll do it someday. Well, after I got to Kentucky and they settled out this uh, suit, they uh, said, well, it looks like you're going to be in a wheelchair. So what can you do if you're in a wheelchair? You know, and they really believed that I should be self-supporting through my own contributions, and I still believe that, too. I think every woman, if you want to have freedom, I don't care if your husband does have a lot of money. You know, you need to be self-supporting through your own contributions, you know. And that's the way I really feel. So anyway, uh, I started going to uh, graduate school. And uh, they said, well, you can go uh, be a counselor. And, and, you know, when I was at York Street, everybody that didn't have a job, didn't know what to do, was going nowhere, became an alcoholic counselor in 1972. Uh-huh. It was the most disgusting thing. And, and I knew I never wanted to be an alcoholic counselor. You know, and it was real contempt prior to investigation. And so when they got me into that program, I thought, oh, you know, God, I said, what are you doing to me? You know, I just said, I don't want to be a counselor. And it's just like, you know, show up, dummy. Just go just go see what it's all about. And so I went in there and learned a lot of things and, and found out that, you know, this program, the more I learned about psychology and stuff, the more I loved this program. It really is it's amazing. What Bill and Bob did with this program, he gave us some fundamental rules of life in a form that we can understand, you know. And and so I started doing that, and, and then I got a job. I worked at Churchill Downs and, and worked with women, and um, that that was tough duty, uh, working on the backside of any racetrack. Um, the drug and alcohol on most racetracks is just free-flowing, and that's why people go back there and work. They go maybe for the love of the horses, but they stay for the love of the drugs. And there's free love, there's free sex, there's free drugs. I mean... What's interesting about that is at Churchill Downs, there's nine law enforcement agencies, the FBI, the DEA, you know, they're all there with the drugs and the alcohol. I knew the drug dealers by the names, and the drug dealers would bring the women to me. And and their deal is, you know, hey, if you want to get sober, that's your business, and we'll help you. But if you want to do that stuff, that's your business also. And and they just don't stop it. And uh, it just happens, and, and so it really became an outside issue with me because I had to leave that alone. I knew I couldn't change that whole industry, you know. And uh, if they're going to drug the horses and the athletes, you know they're going to let the people take all the drugs that they want to. But uh, anyway, I worked in that for a while, and, and uh, I got my master's degree and, and uh, went on. And this last spring... I um, thought, why well, I ought to apply for the doctorate program, just for, just a kick in the pants, you know, just see what happens. And so I did. And you know what happened? They let me in. I thought that was the most amazing thing. And then I knew it was really a God deal, you know, because I shouldn't be there. And I give a lot of those students hope, those those young kids that, that don't think that they're smart enough. And I said, look, it, they let me in the program. I know. They'll let you, you know. <laughs> 
They think, oh, Grandma here is amazing. This one woman said, I wish my mother would get up and do what you're doing, you know. And I said, well, she probably would. Just give her a chance, you know. And uh, But uh, I finally had to stick around for that program, too, because I'm in a, a program in health education and the mind, body, spirit. And the people that I'm working with are all in the mind, body, spirit. And what I find the most interesting thing is that, you know, your mind and your body are connected. And I thought that was an amazing point, revelation, you know. And uh, what you think happens. And, and what I found that, that I think had really affected my body, and I find that with so many other illnesses. And that's where I'm going to go into is into the health psychology and help people that have terminal illnesses. Uh, right now I'm taking a class with uh, people that um, are terminal, they have cancer, and they're dying. And going in and using all the principles that I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous to uh, talk to them. Pretty interesting, an old drunk like this. So... That, that's sort of what I'm up to, and I, I just have a, a daily adventure. I still sponsor a lot of people. When I got into the program, I went to all the people I sponsored, and I said, look at now, girls, I'm going to be in a doctorate program. And they said, yes. And I said, well, I can't be there all the time for you, and you ought to find another sponsor. I really suggest you do. Do you know what they said? You're not leaving this world to go on to this program. We're not leaving you. And besides, you need us more today than you ever did because you might get sick. You might start believing all that nonsense you're studying, you know? <laughs> and, and so what they did is that, um, because I'm hard to get to, well, they're coming to me. We have a money study group, and uh, we all, they all come down to the university club. We're called the Lunch Bunch. And all the people that I sponsor, they come right down there. And then they found out, I have an office at the university, and they found out where that's at. You know what? They drop in just all the time, just drop it in. And, and my professor, I finally had to tell him I was an Alcoholics Anonymous because all these people are dropping in and we hug and carry on. And, you know, and he just he just thought we were an interesting bunch, you know. And, and then I've been on the road here lately, you know, and he either thought I was a multimillionaire. He didn't know I was a jet set or what, you know. And I told him, I said, well, I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous and I go speak occasionally. And he said, that's a neat deal. He said, I'm so happy. You know, and I thought, well, that's great. And, and um, so now he understands why when all these people come in, it's just like, you know, we hug and kiss and carry on. It's, it's a lot of fun. But uh, I'm able to take that and use it in all my areas of my life. And that's what we need to do. We need to be able to take this program, all the principles and, and everything that we learn, and apply it to every area of our life. And, and for this alcoholic, and, and it took me a long time, but I'm glad I didn't miss it. So no matter where you're at, you know, jump right back into the program. You know, there's pockets of enthusiasm. I find it around the country. You're very fortunate. Right here, right now is the time to begin. And um, I'm going to go ahead and close. And I always like to close. We used to close this in the Denver Young Peoples. And there's a part in the book that, that still applies, and I think it's sort of neat. We, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm a member in good standing of the Speakeasy Friday Night Group. And if you're ever in Louisville, Kentucky, I invite you to come and visit with us. We meet every Friday night at 7.30, and we just have a lot of fun there. But we always close our meeting with this. It says, our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously, you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Thank you very much. My name is Camille, and I'm still an alcoholic. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.